God's house. Amen. What about you? Why don't we call the name of Jesus together? Amen. Just ask God to have his way in our hearts and minds. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight. Lord, there's power in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God, for your blessings in this house, Lord. Your mercy is here, Jesus, Lord. Your grace which is sufficient tonight, God. We give you the glory and praise, Jesus, Lord. For you are great, greatly to be praised, God. There's nobody like our God tonight, God. We give you the thanks, God, and the glory belongs to you, Jesus. We give you the glory, Jesus. amazing grace. It was the hour 
who have first believed. Let's sing it unto him. Thank you, Lord. It was amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. tonight that God's going to hear us. Amen. Let's remember the Lorman family as we pray. Uh, Rick Shin needs our prayers as we pray. Laura Christmas, need her, bring her before the Lord. Uh, the Fred Kennedy family has passed away and we need to remember that family in our prayers tonight as we pray. Thank you. Uh, 
Junior Wilson has cancer and needs our prayers tonight for healing for his body. We need to remember him. Just remember those that couldn't be here tonight. Just remember Sister Sandy Rusnick. Amen. Also, let's remember Sister Rhonda Murnahan as well, Brother Cliff Thomas, Sister Tammy Williams in our prayers tonight for healing and strength. Amen. And those that are sick tonight, let's remember the Slater family. Amen. Also, let's remember Nathan, Mr. Dunwoody. Let's remember Tom Davis. Kling, Jerry Klingler needs our prayers. And Barbara London, let's remember her for healing. Amen. And Helen Childers needs our prayers. Brother Paul Thomas, let's lift him up before the Lord tonight. Let's remember him in prayer. May God to strengthen him and touch him. Amen. And by the uplifted hand tonight, if you have a need in the house of the Lord tonight, Brother amen. Hunt. God has an answer for your need. If you would stand, if you're able to, as we begin to pray, let's just call on the name of the Lord. Brother amen. Brother Bill Hupp, let's remember him tonight in prayer. Amen. God will just help him, strengthen him, and bless him tonight as we pray. If you need healing, if you need God to do something, would you make your way to the front? And we're just going to trust Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Who else can we turn to? He has the answers tonight. He does. He still, still does. Amen. Let's call on him together. Church, let's just bind together. Let's get our minds on the Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we've come to this house. Lord, exalt you, God. We ask, Lord, that you'd meet the needs of your people one more time, Jesus. If you're able to do, God, what you said you would do, God, we're encouraged by that, God. We have faith in your word, God, and what you promised, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for it, God. God, we ask that you would move upon every need tonight, God, every uplifted hand, God, every unspoken request, Jesus, Lord, every family member, God, every need tonight, those that are working, those that are traveling, God, we ask your protective hand, oh, God, in the drawing of your spirit, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray, God, for Sister Tammy tonight to receive healing and strength in her her body. Those that are watching at home, God, that you would touch them, Lord. God, move in their lives, in their homes, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, as they call on your name, oh God, that you would answer, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. For the Lord and family tonight, God, we pray, Lord. God, I pray you touch, Lord, and move up on burning hand tonight, God. God, we pray those that are recovering, God, from sickness, Lord. God, those that need strength tonight, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord. This brother Scott tonight, Lord. In the name of Jesus, Jesus, Lord, grant strength, oh God, where strength is needed, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray, God, that you would move up on Brother Cliff tonight with strength, Brother Paul Thomas, Brother Bill Hupp tonight, Lord. God, you'd move on their bodies, Lord, with healing, Jesus, Lord. Continue to raise up, we ask you, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, send strength tonight. Send your virtue tonight, oh God, in Jesus' name. Work in every heart and every life, Lord. Your spirit, your power would come in, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we believe you, Lord. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, Jesus' mighty name, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying. And ask the usher to come forward to receive this evening's offering. Amen. Amen. Good to see everyone. Remember the services coming up this weekend. Amen. God will continue to move in a mighty way. Amen. Had some great services. Seen a great crowd here. Amen. A lot of good things going on. Amen. <laughs> Keep your head lifted high. Amen. <laughs> God's doing great things. Amen. Be encouraged. Amen. He is still help to us. He's still strengthening us. Amen. Amen. Let's ask the Lord's blessing over this offering. Brother Brett, would you ask God's blessing, please? said amen the ushers will come to you tonight to receive your offering god bless you for giving praise the lord everyone oh praise the lord everyone okay god bless you it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight and to uh, be able to feel his presence. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Praise the Lord. We had a great sort of a Sunday night. Amen, Brother Shane preached a marvelous message. I don't know if anyone noticed it or not, but the thing that I thought was really interesting and powerful is that I used Mark 5, 
Sunday morning, and then Brother Shane gets up and uses it. And I saw him back in the back in what I call the tunnel. I said, did you realize that I used Mark 5 as well? And he's like, no. And he said, I didn't even, didn't even ask my wife. He was in a Sunday school class, and so he was focused. And it's good to be focused, praise God, on the things that God wants to bring into our lives. Amen. And I'm just, I'm just uh, amazed, and I, I think that uh, I think Brother Shane heard from the Lord, and I'm, I'm so glad for that. Amen. We want to keep Brother Scott in our prayers. Uh, he's uh, recovering from COVID, uh, but uh, nasty bug just don't want to let go. And so we want to keep him in pr our prayers. Uh, Brother Bill Hupp uh, had surgery yes, uh, Monday. I, I didn't get any, uh, any communication about how he's doing. I'm hoping that he's well. Maybe he's watching and he'll say something online tonight. But uh, we're, we're just trusting that the Lord will be good to him or has been good to him. Brother Thomas, just please keep him in your prayers, Brother Paul. Amen. And uh, just thankful for that. It's good to see Brother John Amore here tonight. Amen. So we're so glad to see him. And all of you wonderful people of God. Amen. Looks like uh, we've got a good crew here tonight. And so we're going to stand right now and we're going to turn. We're the Lord. First of all, we're going to dismiss our kiddies. Amen. It's good to have our children, have our children here tonight, and uh, they're having a good time. They uh, they enjoy that. So they go get their temperature checked. But I don't. They're probably going to raise the temperature in the room just a little bit. So we hope they do. We hope they have fun. Praise God. Hopefully, it'll warm up a little bit in here too. Praise God. We're going to turn in the word of the Lord to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. We used this last week as our foundation scripture, and I would just like to revisit that again. I was praying about this, and, you know, sometimes you ask God for something, a word or whatever, and, I mean, He just always answers me when I I ask him for something. How about you? Does he just all right there on the spot? He answers me. Yeah, you all are like, uh huh. I'd like to have some of that, but that's <laughs> that's not the way that God always works. You know, God, God is God, and you know He. But I do believe this: that when we pray and we ask Him for something, I do believe that God hears us and He will He will answer our prayer, and He will. He will move upon us and touch us and bless us. But you know what? His answer may not always come in our timing. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. Praise God. But here's one thing I want you to know. God will never, never answer to our whim. He is not our butler. He is not our servant. Although He did come to serve. But He is our God. Amen. Does everybody have Second Peter chapter 2? Good. I'm glad you got it. While you're there, I want to take your attention. Anybody ever heard of Rural King? Rural King? Yeah, it's right down the road there. They are having another church week. And what that means is that between March the 14th through the 27th, if you spend any money there, like if you would like to go out and buy your husband a new gun, a new shotgun, Brother Chris is back there patting his wife on her shoulder. Or, gentlemen, if you would like to go buy your wife a new wheelbarrow, new chainsaw, this would be the time to do it during those days. And you can upload those receipts. Here's the beautiful thing is that the Rural King will donate 10% of your purchase to the church. Okay? And so, well, you say, well, I don't know how to do all of that. If you just go get the receipt, I'll help you unload it, or excuse me, unload it. I'll help you upload it. There we go. Uh, so it's just for those dates, though, between from the 14th through the 27th. And so, and uh, uh, gentlemen, it would also be a good day to buy your wife, you know, a new, new pistol or something like that. And, you know, my wife, it might be a good time for her, you know, something so. We better get into the word of the Lord. Amen. But just so you know, 
uh, we'll keep that in front of you. One other announcement that we want to make is that on March the 14th, March the 14th, we will be having our annual business meeting. And uh, we've got a little bit of business to take care of this year. Um, so it, it last year was a, a different year, let's put it that way. And so uh, we just want to review what we've done. Uh, in accordance with our bylaws and all of that was just a part of business that we have to do. So that'll be in the PM service at six o'clock on March the 14th. Okay, I think that's all of the business. Praise God. Okay, Second Peter chapter one, verses five through seven, and it says this. And beside this, beside this, giving all diligence. Now, there's two words there that, that go together that form something, a very powerful thought, all diligent. You know, you think that when you are diligent, that that's saying something. When you do something diligently, I mean, you're working hard. But when you say you give all diligence, that's, that's you know, that is awesome. That is such a strong thing. And so this really becomes the focus of what we're talking about. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, add knowledge. Verse 6. And to knowledge, temperance. What is temperance? Now, it's preceding a word there called patience. Okay? This word temperance means to be balanced, balanced. Uh, anybody ever walk a tightrope over Niagara? People do that. People go over Niagara in a barrel. I, I haven't heard of that in a long time. But uh, to walk a tightrope, a lot of times what you'll see is that you'll, ha you'll see them with a long pole when they're carrying it. And I'm thinking, what's that, what's that about? Well, it helps them keep their balance, okay? Some people even ride across them in a unicycle, you know, and they're just going right along there. You know what? The Word of God is meant to help us remain balanced, okay? And then it says, add to your temperance, patience, patience. To be temperate, <laughs> to be balanced, it takes a, a steady gait. It takes patience. It, it uh, is really the opposite of uh, frustration, okay? It is, it is walking patiently. It is believing and having faith that God is going to answer your prayer. Then it says, and to patience. Now, remember, what we're doing here is we're adding some things, we're adding ingredients to it, and so it's kind of like a stack. Before you can add some of these other things, you have to have the preceding ingredient, all right? So we finally come to godliness, verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Does everybody know what charity is? Well, that's when you give stuff away to people, right? <laughs> it's, it's love. In the Greek language, there are several words that mean love. Charity is the ultimate uh, word for love, and it really means uh, God's love. It's like God's love. In other words, uh, there are some things that people give away with stipulations. You know, anybody ever bought something and got a guarantee? This is a lifetime guarantee, but now they've changed it. It's a limited lifetime guarantee. In other words, there are stipulations. If you use it this way, or if you use it every day, it's not meant to be used every day. Some vacuum cleaners come that way. You're not supposed to use it every day like an industrial setting, and so that's their way out of it, okay? And they'll use your words against you. But God's love has no strings attached. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. And so tonight, as we move forward, we talked about some of the role models, Christian character, and we had literally, we had talked about Uriah the Hittite, we had talked about Job, and we had worked our way through, and I, 
I wanted to go further in this series because I, and, and to make this a series even, because I, I felt like God was saying something to us, talking to us. And so as I was considering this, the Lord just dropped a thought into my mind uh, at the most inopportune time, and so it means i got to write it down. So in my notes, this is, this is written here. And all of these people that we've considered, the thing that we need to understand is that God uses men and women. He uses humanity. And that we are His vessels. God will always use a man. God has chosen that through the foolishness of preaching. Now notice, it didn't say foolish preaching. It said the foolishness, foolishness of preaching. And what that means is that we need reminders. We need reminders. Has anybody ever forgotten an appointment? Some dental appointments are great to forget. You know, when they're scheduled, you a, a root canal. How many of you show up early for root canals? Or for your wisdom teeth to be taken out? Um, or to get a crown? Or, you know, hey... To give blood. Some people don't like needles. How many of you like needles? I don't mind needles unless they're in somebody else. So that's fine, you know. I, I would almost pay somebody to, to take my needle. But, you know, if i got to have one, then i got to have it, and that's fine. Here's what I want to say. God uses people to meet out His glory. He really does. We become literally... Uh, God's vessels, but not just any vessel. There are, there are, and if I can say this, is conditional blessings. When we, when we go back and we look through the Scriptures, we will find God says, I will use you if. And those, those addendums are there. And why would that be? Because Christian character is the, is the highway. It is the road that God uses to dispense His power. Now, I will say this here. That God can use anybody. God is sovereign, and He can use anybody. You go back and read through your Bible, and you will find a, a prophet by the name of Balaam that was hired by an evil king to, to curse the children of Israel. But here's the thing. Although he was prepared to... Re, to take money and almost a bribe to, to speak against God's people. There was something about it. Even though he stepped forward to do it, God said, you will not be able to, to curse my people. And so every time that he tried to open his mouth to curse the people of God, God caused a blessing to come out of his mouth. And, you know, uh, there's something about that. I don't want God to use me in spite or in, the, in spite of the position that I am in that he actually actually has to take over my mouth to speak I would rather a man be have this Christian character displayed in my life amen and uh, I think the interesting thing is this is it towards the end of the story when you see and I, I think it speaks to uh, Balaam's character and his nature is that Yes, he was used by God to speak, uh, but there was one thing that, that even he, in the end when he was trying to leave and, and to go away, uh, God actually used his donkey, gave his donkey the ability to speak and to ask him, why are you beating me? Uh, why are you mistreating me? Why are you being rough with me? And it was after the donkey spoke that God opened his eyes. And Balaam saw that there was an angel with the flaming sword that was there protecting the things of God. I want us to know tonight that, that you know, somehow there may be a little bit of, and I, I hate to even use this word, but almost luck. You know, that's kind of what was happening with, with Balaam. I, I just think that, that he was in a position that he was hired to, to do something for the enemy, but God would not allow it. Now, let's, let's compare that. 
to a man by the name of Abram, Abraham. In Genesis 18, Abraham pleaded with God over Sodom. And you know, sometimes it, you might look at that story, if you understand the story of Sodom, Sodom was full of wickedness. Sodom was, was, has become even synonymous uh, with wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah, it's just the, the place where, where gross immorality lived and, and was breeded and was, was there really to stand up literally in the face of God's people. But I want you to notice Abraham's posture. Abraham did not, he didn't curse the darkness. He didn't, he didn't say, God, just go ahead and destroy it. But God, but, but there was something about Abraham's heart that he pleaded with God for the very people that were in that city. Now, you might say, well, pastor, his, his family was in there. He had daughters that wouldn't come out. He had obviously had grandchildren that were there, and, and certainly he had a reason to plead. But, but we don't just see the plead. He, he, was, he was literally negotiating with God. Lord, if there's 50 people, and he worked it all the way down to a, a very low number, and, and, and God just kept agreeing. God kept saying, I, I will... I will accept your agreement. But there came a point, and notice this, there came a point to when God said enough is enough. But you notice, Abraham didn't stop trying. Abraham kept trying to reach his world. He said this, Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? And that is a question that we need to look at today. And it's not that we're going to convert the whole world. Now, I don't know that that's possible, but we should be trying. There should be, to us, there should be no lost causes. Hello, somebody. It doesn't matter how messed up they are. You, you can think about the one you see that's walking down the street, that's, that's sleeping in the street, that's sleeping under the bridge, and you might think that they have no chance, no opportunity. Let me tell you that God is a healer, that God is a rewarder, amen, to them that, and listen to this word, that diligently seek Him, amen. All diligence we should give to God with, with what, what is the hope that is on, on us, praise God, and in Him. In Genesis 22, the Bible says that He offered His son Isaac on Mount Moriah. Now think about that. Mount Moriah, this is where this son uh, Isaac, this, His only son, that was given to Him as the promise. Now, you one would think, I would think, Probably you are too. This is, the, this is God's promise to Abraham. This is the one to where he is going to bring the life and uh, the posterity, amen, of, of Abraham, of, of all Christian character through. But there is something about it. If God calls us, amen, that he's going to use us. And I want you to notice the focus there. He didn't ask him to offer somebody else's son. He didn't ask for the, the full commitment of something else. God asked him for the full commitment of his only family. You know what? We've got to put our families on the altar. We have got to say, God, this is your son, this is your daughter, and Lord, I give them to you with no strings attached. You know Abraham didn't know what was going to happen. There is no commentary, amen, in, in early in the Scripture in chapter 21 or early in 22 that says that, that if you do this, Abraham, that I will rescue you. I will rescue uh, Isaac. There was none of that commentary. All it lets us know is that the wood was cut, that he had two young men that he took with him. He took it all, the, the wood, the rope, the fire, and the knife, and he he climbed that mountain, and he didn't allow the servants to come to help him to carry the materials. No, friend, it was him 
and his son. The commitment sometimes that, that uh, really giving our lives to God requires it requires sometimes some loneliness. It, it requires some times of, of maybe a little bit harder work on us uh, than, than what we would uh, think that God would want to do. You know, you think about the things of God, and, and God certainly has all power. There is no doubt about that. Couldn't God have done something different than to ask Abraham for his son Isaac? And I would say to you, that God certainly could have. But there is something about God that the blessing always comes, amen, through sacrifice. Through sa it will always come through sacrifice. There are no shortcuts in God's economy. If you're looking for a shortcut, then go to the world. They're full of shortcuts. But if you're looking for the blessing of God, it's going to require you, amen, to go through hard places sometimes. But I want to let you know something in a hard place with God, amen, is easier, amen, than an easy place in the world and what the devil can offer. Because the devil really has nothing that he can give us. Might, he might give us, show us, pictures and and make empty promises but he cannot fulfill in those promises we serve a god a man that is able to do abundantly and exceedingly above all that we could ask or think and he can make a way out of a closed door Amen. He can put a door, amen, where there's just a wall, praise God. He can come in and he can move. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here tonight. Hallelujah. Abraham didn't play games with God. He was willing to offer his son, the son of promise, as a sacrifice, demonstrating his obedience, listen to this, to God. I know there are a lot of people in this world that's just trying to impress others. They live by what the polls say. They say and speak, amen, by what they believe other people and the masses want to hear. That's called politics. God is not political. Amen. God's word is forever settled in heaven. You follow God's way, amen, and you are going to end up on a road that one of these days is going to turn to gold. Hello, somebody. And so he went to great lengths to carry out God's orders, God's requests, God's commands. He rose early and was absolutely prepared for the task at hand. He was prepared. He was meticulous in his obedience, even to the most difficult of God's commands. And sometimes those things, we might think that God is asking us to walk in places that are absolutely impossible for us to live through. But I want you to know that God has the ability to make a door to provide an ultimate route, an alternate route that has the ability, amen, to make a way where there is no way. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, there was an easier way. There was a way that, that didn't involve any of the things, amen, that, that the children of Israel had to go through. There was no Red Sea. There was no, no, no problem that they could have been to to Sinai in, in a much easier amount of time. But let me just say this here. Even though there was not an impediment in that path, I want you to know, amen, there was not a Red Sea for the Egyptians to die in either. God used the, the Red Sea, amen, to destroy the strength of Egypt. I, I want to let you know something today that the sacrifice and the path that God will call upon you to walk in will remove the influences of the enemy and of the world from your life. Praise God. There'll be a power that comes upon you that you didn't realize that you had. The children of Israel, once they got through that, through that uh, wall of water on both sides, they got to the other side and possibly could look in and see, you know, the enemy coming. They didn't know what God was going to do. But I want to let you know something, that God never opens a door for the devil to destroy you. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. And Abraham refused. 
And you think about it, there was a time when, when Abraham, uh, he, you know, he, some people would say, well, he followed God, but he didn't follow God uh, in completeness. So there was a time in his life when he just followed maybe half-heartedly, halfway. You know, when God asked him to leave the Ur of the Chaldees, he said, I want you to leave your family. That meant every one of them. He said, there's sin here. You, you need to leave that culture behind. I'm going to lead you to a place that I want you to go. That I will show you, he said. Well, it just so happened that he decided to take Lot with him. But you don't want you to notice something. That God never revealed his complete plan for Abraham until he followed God's path completely. And when he separated himself from Lot and from his herdmen, I want you to know it was then that God showed up and spoke to him again. Now, he did not strive with, with Lot's herdmen. He didn't strive with Lot. You know, there, there became a, a striving between the herdmen. And, and finally, Abraham, being the leader that he was, he came to Lot and he said this. He gave him the choice. You would think that he, being the senior, would say, okay, I'm going this way and you go that way. He didn't do it. He gave the younger the choice. And when he did that, Lot, the Bible says, chose the well-watered plains of Jordan. Now, a big mistake because those, that's where the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were, were toward that direction. He looked around, and this is a hard way over here. It looks like a hard way. It looks like the desert. It looks like there's a lot of trouble and work and sweat over here. But over this way, there's palm trees or cities. There's the lushness of the land, and everything looks great. But the problem is uh, the Sodom and Gomorrah were there. You know, it's possibly possible that Lot really needed the challenge of the desert. Could Abraham have withstood going that way? I'm not sure. But here's what I know. I do know that, that Abraham never, he did not choose to take the easy path with Isaac. And I believe, amen, that, that he was giving this and it was God's will. You, you study the life of Lot and you see how incest came into his family. Why? Because he made one wrong decision. One wrong decision can destroy your family and yourself, your own soul. Hallelujah. Abraham refused the wealth of king, the king of Sodom after he went and recaptured Lot and delivered him. He was, he was not a greedy man. In fact, uh, when Melchizedek came around, he was the only one that he offered. He said, you know, you, the only thing that we're going to take is, is the victuals that, that we had for the young men. He said, I will not take anything from you because here's what I want you to know. And here's what we've got to be careful of, saints of God, and that is this. Abraham said this, I will not give the, the armies or the kings that are around me the opportunity to say that they made Abraham rich. My blessing will not come from you. He understood something, that the real blessings of this life do not come from men, women, does not come. And I hear lots of people doing name dropping. I just want to say this. You don't need to drop. The only name that you need to drop is the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved, praise God. When we depend and call on the name of God, amen, He'll deliver us. It doesn't matter how bad it is. doesn't matter how deep the ocean or the valley. doesn't matter how high the mountain is. God has the ability to pull the mountains down, to build, pull the valleys up, and to make it a level ground spiritually for us. Oh, hallelujah. Can you clap your hands to the Lord tonight? I'm, I feel him tonight. Amen. And instead of receiving a monetary blessing, Abraham instead went to Melchizedek. And when you study out the life of Melchizedek, you see, you know, no father, no mother, no beginning, and no end is ever mentioned. And, and he is 
He is literally, in some circles, believed to be a pre-exilic uh, uh, physical body of Jesus Christ. And that he, he gave tithe, the Bible says. Before the law ever came, Abraham gave tithe, amen, to Melchizedek. He was the one that should have been getting paid, but instead he said, you know what, God, here's the blessing. I'm, I'm going to, I understand something. He said, I understand that there was a blessing that comes when I honor you. My substance is not here because of what I have done. And the day that ever comes that we believe that we earned something, that we deserve something, that's a bad day, folks. You know, I am blessed. Hello, anybody else blessed out there? Anybody just feel like, you know, God has given me more, hallelujah, than I ever deserved. I don't deserve anything, but God has blessed us, blessed me, and he's blessed you. I, I, can, I can remember some of the old timers getting up, and they would, they would just look out at the church, and they say, oh, what a blessed people you are. Fellows like old brother N.J. Bibbs and, and uh, brother Starr from Michigan, some of these men that just got up and, and they believed in the blessing of God. They just believed that the Lord was going to pour out His Spirit, amen, when they got up and began to speak the Word of the Lord. You know why that is? It's because the Lord said that my Word will go forth and it will not return void. I believe that we are blessed tonight because we're in the house of God. I believe that we're blessed tonight, amen, because there's something in our heart that says, I just got to be in the house of God. I'm not here, amen, to, to punch a time clock. I'm not here, amen, to just, you know, because of somebody's to see what suit I'm wearing. It's the same one I had on the other night, and bless God, and it's gone, I'm probably going to get a few more wear out, a few more wears out of this one here. Amen. Because this is this isn't something that that uh, you know that I look to. This is here to cover. Right? This is here to cover. But you know what? There's a more uh, important covering to me, and that is the covering of the Holy Ghost. I got to have his anointing. I got to have his blessing. I've got to there's got to be something. And so, you know, the the motives, the pure motives Amen. That, that Abraham brought. Oh, they clearly defined his character. And if we're doing something to be seen, dear God, help us. He always thought of God and others before himself. And you know what? God expressed his confidence. You know, Abraham was called the friend of God. Because he was, he was looking for a city. And he had seen some cities. He had seen some rough ones. But he was looking for a city who hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. I'm looking for the city of God. I don't know about you. I think we're still looking for the city of God. I think there's something about the church. Hey, man, it's got a little bit of Abraham, hopefully a whole lot of Abraham in it. Amen. So that God can use us to bring to pass His will. Amen. That as we seek Him, amen, with our whole hearts, He will bless. God could trust Him to explicitly follow instructions. You know, I don't know if, if there's been anything in your life that's been too hard for you to follow. Anything that God has put in your life. Let me just tell you that if you'll be faithful in a few things... God will make you ruler over many. Hallelujah. Amen. Abraham did not obey the, the commandments of God out of fear. But because of who he was, because of his strength of character, the friend of God. What an example. Somebody that we can look to. King David, we look in his life. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 3 says this. Let's just turn there. 2 Samuel. 
2 Samuel 23 and 3. It says this, The God of Israel said, Rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth, the God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me. He that rule, ruleth over men must be just ruling in the fear of God. Let's go to 1 Kings 15 and 5. 1 Kings 15 and 5, just a few pages probably. 1 Kings 15 and 5. And let's read it. It says, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Did he always do that? There was one time. His, his uh, resume was soiled by one event that I believe that he tried the rest of his life to live down, to overcome. And I know a lot of people that they get discouraged and that they cannot overcome their past. You know what? Here's the thing that you need to understand is that everybody has a past. Everybody has a past. There is something that happened. There is something maybe you're ashamed of, something that, that happened that wasn't your fault. Maybe you were accosted. Maybe you were burglarized. Maybe, dear Lord, help us, you were raped. You were mugged. And there are many people that do not want to tell that. And they're ashamed. They have no reason to be ashamed. You know what? They are the victim. But you know what? Most of the time, it is the victim that suffers the most. And you know what? That's what the devil wants to turn you into is a victim. Here's the problem with being a victim. What it means is that you accept that God's power is not great enough to release you from your past. But here's what the Apostle Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind. In other words, my past may be there. And it'll always be there, but you've got to have the courage to get up and to start walking away from it and moving in the right direction. Hello, somebody. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He said, I press for the prize, for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. It is something to be prized. The high calling of God, amen, is, should be so precious that we seek after it with everything within us. Praise God. There shouldn't be anything more important in our lives. There really shouldn't be anything more important in our lives. Amen. I, I just want to look at this verse again. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything, that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And we talked about that last week. You see, that one thing can dog you the rest of your life. But notice that David, it, did, it said this, it doesn't say that he didn't turn back. It said that he did not, let's look at it, and turned not aside. In other words, he didn't go this way or he didn't go that way. It wasn't even a turning to the side, let alone going back. Let me encourage you tonight. Forget your past. Forget all of the things that the, that the devil, there was a man that wrote a song years ago uh, by the name of Carmen, and he wrote a song that says, Satan, bite the dust. Some of you need to tell Satan to bite the dust. And when he comes around reminding you of your past, you need to remind him of his future. Amen. He's the one why God constructed the lake of fire. He's the one, amen, that hell even exists in the first place. Praise God. He didn't make it for us. He made it for him. Hallelujah. I want you to know, amen, that God, amen, will move in your life. Amen. There is that explanation that David did God's command. 
David survived, listen to this, the storm because of his character. He trusted God more than anything else. And so he demonstrated the sterling qualities, grieving over Abner, the story of how Abner, you know, gave his life. He, he was, he was the, the, the captain of the guard. Can you hear me now? Am I squealing anymore? No. But you see, Abner was a captain of, of the guard for Saul. And, and there came a time, you know, when they were supposed to, and, and, and it was Joab that killed Abner, who was a very honorable man. Later on in Joab's life, at the end of David's life, he said, you know what, don't, don't allow Joab to come to his grave in peace because of what he did. And even though Joab, he, he escaped from, from the armies, the men that were holding him, and he ran and he literally grabbed hold of the horns of, his, of the altar of God. And he was pleading for mercy of God. There was something about it that God looked at that character and said, no. And why was that? It was because of the hardness of his heart. Think about it. He's the one that ordered uh, Uriah into the, to the hotter, hottest part of the battle, and then he withdrew from him. Please tell me what kind of man is honorable in those things. How in the world is somebody like that qualified to lead? He certainly wasn't like Abraham. He wasn't like uh, David. But David's the one that commanded him. It should have been Joab that came to David's request. There should have been a note that was sent back and said, I will not do this. I don't know why that you're trying to do this to, my, to this man, but I will not participate. Think what would have happened. Remember who it was. A prophet of God was called to walk into the king's chamber. Into his, into his court. Who was it? Nathan the prophet. God gave him a word. He walked in, and, and do you just blurt it out and go direct? Well, that's not, not the way that it went. But he went in and he told a story about a man that had all kinds of lambs, that had all kinds of sheep, that was rich beyond compare. And then there was one family that had just one little lamb. They treated it like a pet. They loved it. They had named it everything about that little lamb. And so one day, the, the, the rich person had a, had a, a friend that came to, to visit a dignitary. And he told his servant, he said, I want you to go prepare a, a meal but I don't want you using ours. I want you to go get that little lamb over there. And they killed the lamb. And this was a story, but it was an allegory that was talking about David taking Uriah's wife Bathsheba. The story infuriated David. Who is the man that hath done this? Please tell me his name, the man that has stooped so low in his life that he would do such a de deed. And he, they, took the, they took the little lamb and they killed it and they cooked it and they fed it to this man while the other man had all kinds of animals that he could take and, 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 and used. And it was that point when David expressed his rage that the prophet Nathan looked at him and he said, Thou art the man. You're the one. Let me tell you something. That's the same position that Joab was in. He could have said, King, this is not right, but he did not. Let me just say something. There will be a choice in our lives. 
And I hope that you make the right choice. But I also want to encourage you that if you fail, that you are man enough to stand up like David and say, yes, I failed. The Bible says that when Nathan said that, David repented. He repented with everything that was in him. The Bible lets us know that Bathsheba had become expectant with the child from, her, from the relationship with David. But the Bible also tells us uh, that the child became sick and, uh, at, at, you know, after it was born. And, and as he was there, the Bible says that, that he cried, that he fasted for days. Why? Because there was something in his heart. You see, Joseph explained it very well. When Potiphar's wife came to him, she was trying to seduce him. Joseph, as he was trying to be manipulated, trying to be controlled by one with more power than he had, he looked at her and said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? We've got to understand something, folks, that the people that, that may come in our lives and that we may interact with, they, they, they don't look like God, they they may not act like God, but if you will look at the situation and you will see through, through spiritual eyes, you will understand, praise God, that every sin is against God. That everything that, that we come into is really, amen, about our relationship with the Lord. There's got to be something in us that we cry out to God and say, Lord, you mean more to me than anyone else. That person that cuts you off when you're driving down Maple Avenue. Hold on, friend. Keep all of your digits at the same level. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Control your temper. Don't carry a rock underneath your, in, in your floorboard of your front seat. You'll be tempted to use it. And you just might. Don't carry a ball bat in your trunk. Hello, somebody. We got to understand something. That God's the one that let that car pull out in front of you. Are you going to get mad at God? Well, Joshua, the character of Joshua exemplifies the loyalty of a second man. He was always there with Moses. He led a victorious battle and army under Moses' direction. And he faithfully attends to God's prophet during times of great stress as the people murmured against Moses, but he was faithful. Let me just ask a question. Do you think any of those folks came up to him and said, you know what, Josh? Moses just ain't getting it done. I think you would make a great leader. I think you could do a better job than Moses is doing. You know what? I never read in my Bible where, where it mentions any of that. I don't think that Joseph would have listened to those kinds of things. But you see, these are the temptations that the enemy will bring in our life. The devil will do his best to destroy your relationship with your leader. Hello. And I'm not saying this just because I'm the pastor of this church, but I'm saying this because this is what God will try to do to me. This is what God will try to do to you. The Lord is looking, listen to this, for loyalty. Because here's something you need to understand, Josh. One of these days, you will be the leader. How do you want your folks to respond? How do you, how do you want it to go? See, Moses was leading in a hard time. 
Yeah, I think I could do a better job. Are you so sure about that? If you think Moses can't lead the people without God's blessing and Christian character and loyalty, what makes you, Joshua, think that you can usurp authority and without God's blessing lead God's people in a better way? He waited by the door of the tabernacle while Moses was inside, laying before the Lord. He's appointed to divide the land after Israel's victory. That is a powerful role. He is full of the spirit of wisdom. Do you know that God took him and lifted him up? And why was that? Because he was faithful. And it was that faithfulness that God used to bring power into Israel as a result. Oh, hallelujah. Finally, Joshua became the commander-in-chief. He was trusted to do just about everything. And it was he that said, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Jesus. Jesus. If we think we can steal and we can talk about one or backbite and do all those other things, I've got news for you, friend. God can. God won't bless that. But if you'll give him your all diligence, God will use you in ways that you never dreamed possible. God will call, God will use you to just pick up a stick and cause a, a, a seed apart. God will give you the ability to reach down and pick up snakes and, and they turn into sticks. God will give you the ability to stick your hand into your, into your clothing and pull it out and it be leprous. To put it back in, come out and it be pure and white. God will use you to call fire down from heaven. God will use you to do mighty and great things. God will lift you to levels of the highest echelons of government on the face of this earth. God can do whatever He wants to do. As we stand tonight, I I receive a challenge from the Lord, myself. I, I do feel a challenge in my spirit and in this church. God is moving in a mighty way. I don't know if you realize it or not, but there was a uh, Sister Joyce Ford, we got a call last week that she was uh, basically giving up and that her kidneys, you know, uh, the doctor said that they, they were really just bad. And, and so they called and they asked the church to pray. And so we did a call and you folks prayed. She went to the doctor just the other day. And you know what happened? They said that she received one of the highest scores for her kidneys. It's the, the best that they have been since she's been going to the kidney. You talk about opening people's eyes. You talk, oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. There's been some people praying, some people fasting, some people turn around and say, oh, no, I'm not going to follow the temptation of the devil. I'm going to serve the Lord. And God is moving. Hallelujah. You got something, I can tell. Um, she said, Dear church family, I am asking for prayer for my dad, Karen Se Kevin Seamster. He has what most likely is a tumor of his pituitary gland which is pressing on his optic nerve and the pituitary, or causing him significant vision loss. A tumor of the pituitary gland often requires surgery, radiation, and medication 
but they have not ruled out a brain tumor. Please, any prayer would be greatly appreciated. I cannot express how much my dad means to me. Thank you so much. Erin Seamster. And she's a little young blonde. Over there, she's friends with Shay Lynn, Angie's sister. And she really, she's calling on us for prayer. She knows we've got the answer. So let's, let's pray for Kevin Seamster right now. Okay. You know, I don't know the will of the Lord. Here's what I know. If God can heal a kidney, God can heal this. Do you believe that? Why don't we be used to the Lord right now? Let's call on the name of the Lord. Do Dear God, we call on you right now, and we're asking you to touch Kevin Seamster. Lord, in the name of Jesus, uh, oh God, we call on you. We're asking you to move, Lord, in a mighty way. Oh, God, Lord, these folks that are in this room believe that you are able. And, God, we trust you right now. We're asking your, for your mighty hand and your mighty power. Dear God, in the name of Jesus, let your will be done in Jesus' name. And we give you the glory for it, Lord. Let's clap our hands to the Lord right now. Oh, hallelujah. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. I just believe God can do it. I believe that he is a healer. Amen. May the Lord bless you. I pray that something that's been said tonight would encourage your heart, challenge you, amen, to do great things for God in the name of the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for coming in Jesus' name.